Hello, everyone. Hi. Welcome and thank you for coming to the inaugural Mildred Dressel House Lecture. This lectureship has been established in recognition of Millie's outstanding scientific accomplishments, her inspirational mentorship and influential leadership. Through this program, we hope to be able to honor accomplishments of distinguished scientists and engineers whose contributions are uh, resonating with Millie's legacy and the lasting impact that she has had on science and society. It's our honor to be able to actually host this event here at MIT in Millie's name, to be able to remember her, and to also be able to celebrate the accomplishments of scientists like her who continuously inspire us. So to start the inaugural Mildred Dressa House Lecture, I would like to invite Professor Asu Ozdaglar, the head of the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, for some remarks. Thank you, Asu. Thank you. It's wonderful to see everyone here. And I'm honored uh, to introduce the inaugural Mildred Dressel House lecture with some remarks about the extraordinary woman uh, for whom this new MIT Nano series is named. So very briefly, Millie was a physicist, a material scientist, an electrical engineer, an MIT professor, a very prolific researcher, an excellent mentor and supervisor, and a longtime leader in the scientific community. She was widely known as the queen of carbon science for good reason. Her groundbreaking work in nanoscience helped unlock the secrets of carbon and paved the way for much of today's carbon-based nanotechnology. Those accomplishments represented a long road from her beginnings during the Great Depression. Millie was born in New York City in 1930, the child of struggling Polish immigrants, and grew up in a tough neighborhood in the Bronx. Initially, she planned to become a teacher, but while she was an undergraduate at Hunter College, the future Nobel laureate Rosalind Sussman Yellow convinced her to study physics instead. Millie received a bachelor's degree from Hunter, a master's from Redcliffe, and a PhD from University of Chicago, where she studied with Enrico Fermi. During her 57-year career at MIT, Millie achieved plenty of very impressive firsts. Among them, in 1968, she became the first woman to attain the rank of full tenured professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering, now the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. In 1971, she co-founded MIT's first Women's Forum, a seminar exploring women's roles in science and engineering. Two years later, she received a Carnegie Foundation grant to expand her efforts to encourage women to enter the field. Those were just two early examples of her lifelong work on behalf of women in STEM. In 1972, she became the first woman to serve as the department's associate head, paving the way for many others. In 1985, she became the first woman to receive the title of institute professor at MIT. This is, as you uh, all know, MIT's highest faculty honor, held by no more than 12 active professors at one time. In 1990, she became the first woman to win the National Medal of Science for en Engineering in recognition of her research and her extensive efforts on behalf of women in physics and engineering. In 2012, she became the first solo recipient of a Cowley Prize, a prestigious international award that recognizes her outstanding contributions in astrophysics, nanoscience, and neuroscience. During her MIT career, Millie authored or co-authored eight books and some uh, 1,700 uh, papers. She earned a reputation as a gifted instructor, supervised more than 60 doctoral students, and mentored countless other students and faculty. And this is the most impressive part. I was just blown away. She did all this while she and her, hus her husband, Jean, a fellow physicist and longtime MIT researcher, raised four children. Millie also held major leadership positions uh, in the broader scientific community, including serving as the director of the Office of Science at the US Department of Energy, president of both the American Physical Society and of the American Association for Advancement of Science, and chair of the governing board of the American Institute of Physics. 
Among many others, Milley received the U.S. Department of Energy's Enrico Fermi Award, which recognizes lifetime achievement in science in 2012, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the U.S. government's highest civilian honor in 2014, and the IEEE Medal of Honor, the association's top award in 2015. She was an elected member of National Academy of Engineering and National Academy of Sciences, and uh, during her career, she also received a total of 38 honorary uh, degrees from institutions all over the world. Millie passed away in February 2017 after a short illness, but even in her final years, she was active in her field at MIT and in the department. She regularly attended ECS faculty meetings and lunches. She played an important role in developing the nano facility, making it even more fitting that MIT Nano's Distinguished Lecturer Series is named in her honor. Please join me in celebrating uh, this outstanding uh, researchers, Professor Mildred Dresselhaus's contributions to science, engineering, society, and MIT. Thank you. Um, so I would like to make a couple of brief remarks. Uh, my name is Vladimir Bulovich. I'm the director of MIT Nano, facility that just footsteps away from here, and actually footsteps from Millie's old office. Indeed, uh, Jean and her, Jean Dresselhaus and her, would spend time uh, over lunch uh, peering at the construction sites, marveling at the opportunity, and uh, thinking about what's the next set of great things that MIT will discover. Uh, I did have a privilege of interacting with Millie for quite a number of years, and it was a true pleasure to see a sparkle on her face when she started talking about the next generation of students, next generation of discoverers. And as a result, I would also say she would have, have dramatically approved of our choice of the inaugural lecturer of the Mildred Dresselhaus Lecture, uh, Paul McEwen. So let me tell a few things about Paul. First of all, let me welcome him back to the campus. Indeed, Paul's, <laughs> Paul's uh, roots uh, uh, can be connected to just again footsteps away from this lecture room uh, in building 13 on the second floor. Uh, there was a laboratory in which Paul spent his 1990s uh, as a postdoc developing a variety of nanoscale experiments just underneath Millie's uh, laboratory. Um, the um, the uh, way to think about maybe this particular coincidence between Paul and Millie, I was thinking, was maybe to draw a Venn diagram and recognize three different intersections that uh, we should maybe highlight. First, we honor Millie with the inaugural lecture uh, in the new Mildred Dresselhaus Lecture Series. Uh, by your presence, uh, your intersection with nanotechnology and indeed willingness to be a part of this commemoration and also celebration of the great deal of discoveries. For that, thank you very much for being here and sharing this day with us. Second, uh, we are delighted to honor one of the finest creative minds uh, working in nanoscience and nanoengineering today. Um, Paul McEwen uh, has a very distinguished career of discovery. Um, his insightful, thoughtful, and creative spirit uh, indeed has been documented through numerous publications and indeed honors he has received in times past. So let me just put a couple of those up and forward. First of all, um, uh, Paul is a John A. Newman Professor of Physical Sciences at Cornell University. Uh, he directs Kavli Institute at Cornell for Nanoscale Sciences. Uh, his research focuses on the fabrication and study of nanostructures. His group uses these structures to span the gap between the macroscopic and molecular worlds, exploring electronics, optics, mechanics, chemistry, and biology of the nanoscale. His work ranges from the use of carbon nanotubes for optoelectronics and mechanics to the use of graphene and 2D materials for atomic scale origami, active materials, micro and nanomachines, and more, as you're going to find out in lecture in just a little bit. Uh, Paul has also many honors to list. Um, he, to mention a few, he's a fellow of the American Physical Society, member of the National Academy of Sciences, member of the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, his broad talents are recognized in other ways as well. Um, he's recognized with an award for debut novel of the year uh, from the International Thriller Writers Association. Congratulations for that. We should all go to Coop and check the book out. Uh, <laughs> available, I believe, right? Download it right now, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Go to Amazon. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Um, well, so uh, this is only a part of uh, Paul's uh, whole story. Indeed, 
Uh, Paul is also a champion for the importance of scientific research, um, as well as generous colleague and mentor. And it's easy to admire his work once you start hearing him actually deliver the next lecture that you're about to hear. So that brings us to the third uh, part of the Venn diagram intersects. Um, so, uh, Paul, you honor us with your presence here today. Um, and yes, just because you're cool to hang out with, but also, <laughs> especially as the first speaker uh, of the Mildred Dresselhaus Lecture Series, because uh, lecture you're, you're launching is going to be indeed launched, we think, in a fantastic style, thanks to you. So thank you very much for that. Because you might remember, and most of you might have heard, uh, in 1959, there was an MIT alum, Richard Feynman, who gave a speech uh, titled, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, um, An Invitation to Enter a New Field of Physics. And in that speech, Feynman described uh, the potential for making nanoscale machines uh, and other tantalizing possibilities that open up when one is able to manipulate matter at the scale of atoms and molecules. Um, so that radical vision of 60 years ago, almost exactly 60 years ago, uh, painted a picture of a whole new world ready to be explored. You know, but you know, it's one thing to propose that the Earth is round and the other one to actually set sail and test it out. Um, now, Millie uh, was one of those pioneers who took Feynman's up on his invitation and indeed explored the nanoscale, set forth to find that new world, and her intellectual travels charted entirely new territories for us. You know, the pioneer for our time is Paul and others, but Paul, for this generation of explorers, uh, your explorations of atoms, molecules, structures, the way they're put together, indeed is gonna give us the next frontier to explore and indeed go beyond. Um, it is no exaggeration, I think, uh, to say that your discoveries and innovations will help us define the beginnings of what we now can glimpse is the nano age that's upon us. So with that being said, Paul, please join us and actually prove me right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so yeah, first off, I'm just so glad that we could all be here to, to, to celebrate Millie. Um, I mean, this is about, I, I mean, my voice may quaver a little bit. I, you know, when I think of my scientific heroes, it's a very, very short list, and I think at the top of it would be Millie Dresselhaus. And those of you who knew her would, would understand why, and I won't give a long speech about that, but to be able to give this lecture in her honor just means the, the world to me. Um, now with that, I have to do solve some technical problems here. Okay, so that's good. We were having a little bit of trouble earlier, so we shall see. I'm jiggling. <laughs> Bring in the pros here. So while he's uh, working on that, I have a, who, who has access to a pretty decent microscope? Normally you don't get that many hands, but here you're going to get a whole lot of hands. All right, so you don't, you don't get one. Here, you can have one. I don't have that many. Who, who really wants something, even though they don't know what it is and has access? Yeah, all right, you can have one. And you, 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 your hand's down, so you don't get one. You get one. All right, you get one, too. And I'm going to save the other ones. Okay. So in case you're wondering, they, they, they got a penny. Isn't that exciting? Uh, it's very cool. We'll talk a little bit more about the penny in a little bit. Um, have we given up? Yeah, we're going to go in. So we're, we're switching. So I'm a PC person, and I'm now having to give this talk on a Mac. So it ain't going to go well. Uh, uh, so how do I get it to play? The, oh, I have to so, do the, there we go. All right, so, so let's get going. So I, w I was surfing the web the other day, um, and I came across. Uh, 
Jeez, really? No, that's the wrong one. Uh, uh, all right, well, we're going we're gonna to try one more time, and then I'm going to give up on this video. It looks like it's not going to work. Um, if you were, if, if I had a PC instead of a Mac, uh, <laughs> what you would be seeing here, how many of you have seen that robot of uh, the bunch of cheetah robots on the lawn of MIT playing in the leaves? How, okay, so I don't have to show it then. <laughs> uh, everybody here saw that. That was pretty cool, right? Yeah. And, and the, the, you know, the students with you know, their little controllers and doing all that, that was pretty awesome. MIT is fantastic. You're all geniuses. Isn't this great? Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, good for you. Um, <laughs> So that, whoop, wrong computer. Let's see. Now, you want to talk about a cool robot. Now, that's, that's a cool robot. Okay. So this is as many, how many of you know what this is? Probably a lot of you. What is it? It's a, I'll call it water bear, the, the, the common name. So it's a water bear. It's about you know, 100 microns, 200 microns in size, depending on how old it is. Little tiny creature. Find it everywhere. You can take it into deep space, bring it home. It still works. They're just the coolest things. And, and they can also make copies of themselves, so that's not too bad either. Unbelievable machine. Just fantastic. As a bunch of engineers, we should stare in amazement at this piece of technology and think, gosh, I wish I could do something like that. Because we can't do anything like that. Not even close. OK, you can make little things that play in the leaves out there on the lawn. But to build a robot that is uh, on the scale of 100 microns in size and have it work. That would be cool. And, and 100 microns is a very special size, because that's basically the size at which you can resolve things with the naked eye. Okay, So it's the border between the visible and the invisible or microscopic worlds. So when they, that world that they discovered when people like uh, Robert Hooke looked through a microscope and discovered that there was a whole universe of things uh, down at a size scale that we could only imagine before the invention of the microscope. And here we are a few hundred years later, and we still can't build robots like this. OK, so that's a big dream. Well, maybe we can. Maybe we could build robots like this. Is it possible? Um, and, and I think um, one thing to keep in mind is uh, I'll, I'll, you'll see a couple of quotes from Millie. Uh, if you manage your time properly, sometimes you can find time to do crazy stuff. Okay? And so that's what I've been trying to do with my career in the last few years, is to, to find the time to do some crazy stuff. And, and Millie says it's OK to do that. And uh, therefore, I will proceed uh, with her approval. And I suggest you all do the, do the same. So what we're going to talk about is our attempts in uh, a group at Cornell to try to build some kind of microscopic robot that's not going to be half as cool as this or even 100th as cool as this, but maybe is, is a first step. And first off, you might be saying, well, wait, this is a nano thing. What micro? <laughs> that's so you know 1950s. Uh, but, but if you want a micro robot, you need nanoscale parts. Okay, so really, this is an, a, a, an attempt to use nanoscale technology to build something at the micro scale, which I think is one of the big things for the next 30 or so years. So, just at the birth of the transistor, then you gave rise to all the computational systems that we have now. The birth of simple nanoscale mechanical and electronic elements is going to give birth to a robotics technology. At the, at the micro, in the microscopic scale, less than 100 microns. OK, so that's our goal. I should also say up front that uh, lots of people around the world are having similar thoughts and are approaching this problem in a lot of different ways. And I'm not going to attempt to represent all the work in this world. This is meant to be kind of a friendly, fun talk. So we'll just tell you about uh, the work that we're doing at Cornell. OK, so here's a robot, all right, <coughs> stripped to its essence. Uh, so it turns out a robot has two parts. It's got brains, and it's got legs. And that's it. That's the whole robot. And you might say, well, there are arms, but arms are just legs with thumbs. So that really doesn't deserve another category. Uh, so we're going to break up our job of making a robot into these two pieces, uh, the brains and the legs. But you know, how are we going to do it? This is a big challenge to build a small-scale robot. And we're going to take inspiration from, from an unusual source. Uh, and that's Pablo Picasso. And aha, we yet again discover the PC versus Mac problem. Uh, good artists copy great artists, and this is supposed to be there, where it would say steal. That's what Pablo Picasso said. Great artists steal. OK, I don't really know what that means, but we're going to do it anyway. So what are we going to steal? What technology can we steal? 
hint, there's a big picture on the, uh, next to it. Uh, microelectronics technology is the only real nanotech that we've got. Right? You can build incredibly complex circuits. In the scale of that water bear, you can fit something like a million transistors. Okay? That's pretty good. That's a lot of complexity in a small box. So let's try to steal that. That's going to be our approach. And in particular, for the, for the brains, that's basically the end of the story. We're just going to steal technology right away. And so that's what I'm going to talk to you about for the first half today. I'm going to tell you about the stealing the brains uh, to make uh, what I'll call a legless robot. And you might say, well, what good is a legless robot? Uh, and I, I'll say, well, you, pro you actually have a legless robot with you right now. Uh, and you know, here it is. So everybody's carrying the most uh, successful legless robot in the history of the world. In the course of 15 years, it has occupied basically the entire planet and taken control of the host species and got us to do its bidding. So in this simple little legless robot package. Um, so we would like to have something like this, only just a lot smaller. That's the first goal. Combine the kind of intelligence and functionality and multifunctionality of a, of a smartphone, but in a much smaller package. Uh, and here it is. This is our, uh, our, our super simple uh, microscopic cell phone. It even kind of looks like a cell phone. Looks like you could talk into that and listen there or something. Uh, but what these pieces really are, uh, well, first, what we call it, we call it an optical wireless integrated circuit, and we uh, misspelled integrated for some reason. Um, it has on it uh, solar cells up here. That's what power it. You shine light on this little thing to make it go. Uh, it's got some electronics here. In this case, just a simple transistor. It's the simplest possible cell phone you could think of. And then down here, it's got a light emitting diode so that it can blink out light to communicate with you. So what makes this cell phone stand out in addition to being small is instead of communicating with RF, it communicates with light. And the simple reason is that RF doesn't miniaturize well. Uh, the wavelength of RF is way too big. It's that big, so when you shrink it down, it does a terrible job. So we switched over to light. But otherwise, it's, you can sort of analogously think of it as a, just a handheld communication system if your hands were 100 microns in size. Uh, now, you may have said, this all sounds familiar. I remember this field called smart dust, where people were going to make little tiny systems. Uh, and uh, in fact, that's true, and there's been going on for 20 or so years at UC Berkeley was one of the first to really talk about this. And, and there's something about this field. The rules of the field are that you have to put your device on a penny. Um, I don't know why this is the rule, but it's the rule. Uh, so there's the UC Berkeley, some of the early smart dust. The University of Michigan has actually gotten really good at this, and there's their micromote. See there, small compared to a penny. And here's the Cornell one. Uh, now, I'm going to tell you something about a penny you might not know. There's the Lincoln Memorial that's at least on the back of old pennies. What you may not know is inside the Lincoln Memorial, Lincoln is there, just like in the real Lincoln Memorial. How many of you knew that Lincoln was inside of there? Oh, a few of you. <laughs> that's a pretty nerdy thing to know. Uh, <laughs> at, only at MIT. Um, and if you go in on Lincoln's chest, actually there is one of these devices, one of these OX that's there. And in fact, uh, those of you who got one of these pennies, uh, you, your penny has on it um, one of these OIC devices. Uh, and you might say, isn't this expensive to hand out these devices? Uh, the most, ex well, the, 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 the OIC device, at least when it will be mass manufactured, will cost less than the penny. Uh, it'll be cheaper than the penny. In fact, the most expensive thing on these is a little sticker in the corner that says OIC, uh, which cost eight cents. <laughs> that was marketing. Uh, OK, and, and again, how they communicate. So this is an OIC that's in the center of the zero on, on a penny. And hopefully, I can run this movie, and it will work. Yeah, and so it just can blink at you to communicate out. So that's the light coming out of the little LED on the OIC. And, and these things are so small. If you have one of those pennies, and you can stare at it all day long, you're not going to see the OIC on there uh, you, unless you get it under a microscope. You might maybe see a speck, and that's about as good as it'll get. And of course, one of the great benefits of this and the reason that they're so cheap is you don't make them by the ones, you make them by the millions. So about a million of these devices would fit on a four-inch wafer and very old technology. Um, and of course, this is nothing special. This is true of all microelectronics. Uh, but just uh, usually they're all combined together. You don't usually break them off and use them as individuals. 
Uh, but it shows you this amazing power of the semiconductor fabrication approach in lithography. You make things in unbelievable parallel, right? So in a wafer, you can get a million devices. And they can all be different. For example, you can have what, for lack of a better word, we'll call multiple apps. You can have ones that are meant to measure voltages. You can have other ones that are meant to measure temperatures. And they can all have these LEDs on them if you want to blink back out whatever they learned. And in the future, they can be more sophisticated still. Uh, you may be wondering how they got on the penny. So this is one of those OX. You can come in with a sort of a pick and place kind of thing, a little pipette. You can pull on it, pop it out and move it over to where you want it to go. Uh, these are fabricated using an SOI process so that they, we can etch out underneath them and release them. It's kind of like parts in a model you had when you were a kid. Um, and then you can later go take them and put them wherever you want. So you can use your pick and place machine to put them anywhere you want. And again, while this looks cool, honestly, every RF, uh, there's uh, whole industries based on doing pick and place of small electronic devices. Usually, they're a few times bigger than the devices that I'm showing you here, uh, but the, the basic idea is the same. We're just stealing stuff that the semiconductor people know how to do and kind of using it in a different space. And, and we cannot just do this with one, because MIT writes MIT on every paper they ever, you have to write MIT, so you. Uh, so this is uh, Cornell. OK, so there we are. <laughs> Actually, a reviewer said, can you put the, you can't controllably place these things. So we said, all right, reviewer, here you go. So, there you, um, <laughs> By the way, maybe I'll mention uh, all this work is that I'm talking about, or 80% of it is unpublished. So uh, I'm, rather than tell you about you know, long lost history, I'm telling you about the stuff we're, we're interested about in today. Um, OK, so what are these things good for? These are super simple little devices. These are just first gen devices. And you get them by in piles. This is an optical voltage sensor. Again, you shine light on it. It puts out light. And that, the amount of light that comes out is proportional to the voltage difference across those two contacts. And they, they work pretty well. So this is actual data. Whoops, that's, um, there it is. Uh, one of them is we're, we're just, we put some probes down to put a voltage in across these electrodes, and then we look at the light coming out, and they track each other one for one. The devices are fast. They turn on and off in sub-milliseconds, actually much faster than that, because there's no wires, there's no big capacitances. In principle, they can be super fast. And even this super one-transistor little voltmeter can have microvolts per root hertz kinds of noise, and we could do a lot better if we added more transistors. Uh, even this sort of simple device, for example, you can place it in a microfluidic channel and use it to measure the ion concentration inside of the microfluidic channel by, if you run a current through this, how much voltage drops across the OA. So these devices, hopefully in the near future, will be, be used in any kind of microfluidic or in any experiment that you're running where you wish you had a little thermometer or a little voltmeter or something. We want to deliver you a little device that will do that for you. And to, to interact with it, all you'll need is a microscope. Uh, you can also make thermometers. In fact, thermometers, you just need an, uh, photovoltaics and an LED. The, the, basically, the open circuit voltage of a solar cell is temperature dependent in a nice way. Uh, so in this case, we have a little resistor. We'll run heat through here. It'll heat up our thermometer. And again, you can make a very fast uh, thermometer where we can measure sort of millikelvin changes in temperature in very short periods of time. And uh, we're thinking about these for all kinds of of, of uses. Uh, I should mention, by the way, that this effort is being led by Alejandro Cortez, a, a grad student slash postdoc in my group, who's doing a fantastic job. Um, and we're thinking about using, once you've got a little thermometer, you can do all sorts of stuff. I'll just mention one thing as a, an example that might not come to your mind right away. Uh, you can take one of these things and put it and use it as basically a little tiny Pirani gauge, which is a kind of pressure gauge that works by getting hot and the thermal conductivity of the air around it determines how hot it gets. And you can use that to measure the pressure. So we can replace this thing down here with something that's quite a bit lighter and can go anywhere. Uh, so in MEMS packaging and what have you, these might have applications uh, for doing tiny pressure sensing. Um, so we're, we're, you know, we're, we're excited about these things for all kinds of things. Uh, one has to, again, to make Alejandro happy, I have to show that this isn't, isn't easy. And so there's a lot of steps, and there's a lot of lithography. I don't know why he's complaining so much, but uh, all right. Uh, 
and, and I should say, back to Millie, Mill, Millie told us that people who have it too easy in early life have a disadvantage later on because they get thinking that everything is going to be easy. Uh, so I try to make sure my students do not have this problem. <laughs> Some of my uh, ex-students can speak to that, yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, by the way, did I mention these things are small? Yeah, okay, there's one on a, on a fingertip swirl. So they're, they're really tiny. Uh, but true of all of electronics. So a little, this is all a little bit of a flim-flam game. Uh, so why make them so small? What possible reason would you want to make these things so small? And I'll, I'll give you two. The first is just cost, straight up cost. The cost per square inch of, of CMOS on a wafer is fixed. So if you make it, if you go from a millim, if you go in this case, I think we did from 10 millimeter dies down to 0.1 millimeter dies, 100 micron dies, uh, the cost per device drops from $120 to a cent. Okay? So it makes a big difference. You get smaller, you get cheaper, end of story. One to one, as you scale down a linear dimension by 10, the device gets 100 times cheaper. You just win. Um, the second thing is you can, you can uh, do fun things with them. You can play the, that, that Where's Waldo game, you know, where you have to look for the... So we're going to play what, Where's Waldo. Uh, so you have to figure out wh what we're looking at. So there's a, there's a, it's hard to see, but there's some red stuff. Uh, all right, here it comes. There's, a, there's the device. There it is. Uh, in amongst a bunch of red stuff. Uh, oh, yes, we stuck it in a brain. Yeah, okay. So we're very excited about sticking these in people's brains. Uh, at, at, at the moment, we're just putting them inside of mouse's brains, but, but wait, we're coming for you. Uh, <laughs> And, and they are so small, just to give you a sense, you know, if a hypodermic needle, this, you can't even buy a hypodermic needle with an opening uh, much smaller than 100 microns. So you could, you could inject these if you wanted to, uh, or if you want to put them in brains, they're uh, less likely to cause scarring than, say, other uh, larger systems. And so we're, we're very interested in using them for neural applications. In fact, this is the 3D reconstruction, so that's the vasculature of the brain, and there's a device stuck in there. Looks a bit like a spaceship. Um, and we've even started getting, in, in living mice, uh, getting data out of these. Uh, this was just a thermometer device, kind of a test. We just heat up the poor thing's brain and see how hot it gets. Uh, but we can do uh, continuous measurements over many days, and it works just fine. Uh, you just have to put a, a window in the, in the mouse's skull, which is not so great, but this is what optogeneticists do all the time now. So this is a standard uh, technique in their world. Um, in fact, we, we've gotten kind of motivated by this to try to use this to go to the next level. So just a very brief aside on uh, our, our efforts to make devices that are much more complicated that we'll call neural moats, which are to go in the brain and do what amounts to an electrophysiology measurement to measure the electrical activity in the brain, but in a package in that 100 micron scale uh, size that I told you about. Uh, this involves a whole bunch of people. Particularly, I want to use this as an opportunity to mention Al Molnar, who's a really top-notch circuit designer uh, uh, who does... Uh, in the ECE department at Cornell who does all of the circuit design. Uh, I, I give talks. Um, and then there's some biologists that we're working with and some people in the micro-LED area as well. Uh, uh, and these devices, these devices, by the way, we don't make ourselves. The devices I showed you so far, we, we make at the CNF, the Cornell Nanofabrication Facility. Uh, these are much more complicated devices with hundreds of transistors in the same basic footprint but they're designed and then shipped to a, a foundry that makes them and ships them back to us. And then after we get them back, we put on the electrodes and the, uh, the, the LED slash photovoltaics. So we put the optical IO on top of a foundry piece of silicon, uh, and then off we go. And these devices can be much fancier. In fact, this one records the neural signal and then outputs the signal not in the intensity of light, but in pulses of light with the information encoded in the time delay between the pulses. So all you have to be able to do is see the pulses and you can extract the, the relevant information. And you know, so this is the data that comes out, just looks like a series of light pulses. So this is the output of a, some sort of photo detector that is recording uh, information. Um, we've done actual recordings in worms where we have external electrodes, but we have a few in the brains of mice right now that are functioning and so we're taking our very first data. Uh, now. Uh, 
So we're very excited about this, but it also shows you how you can take it to the next level and not just have one or two transistors, but in principle hundreds of transistors or even thousands of transistors in this 100 micron scale robot head. <coughs> okay, so we're excited about these, these little devices for all kinds of things, uh, using them as smart, secure tags for any counterfeiting, uh, using them like the, I told you about before for IoT sensors or, or for neural recording. Um, and in fact, we've even started a, a company uh, to try to commercialize some of this technology. Uh, but there's, there's only one problem with these devices. Well, there's more than one, but there's one big problem. Do you know what it is? It's just a head, right? This is a pretty crappy robot if it doesn't even have any legs. It's just a head. We still need the rest of the robot if we want to have a real robot. So that's what we're going to talk about in the rest of this talk is how we go about building the legs of the robot. Well, you know, we know our philosophy. We just go find a technology and steal it. Well, now we have a problem. It turns out there's nothing to steal. As far as we can tell, there's no obvious uh, theft of a fully CMOS-compatible, integratable set of uh, uh, electrically controlled uh, actuators to use. In fact, this is a, uh, Chi Kun uh, made a graph of some of the technologies that are out there that people have used to make all kinds of different actuators. The two axes here are the voltage that is required to actuate the actuator and the rate one over the, the, the basically one over the, uh, the, the radius of curvature of the device. So it has units of one over millimeters. So this is small and this is big. Uh, there's one millimeter there. So there's lots in robotics. There's things you can use. There's plenty in milli-robotics, milli-robotics meaning things that are millimeter in scale. But if you want to go below that, there's an empty box. There's nothing to steal. Oh, no. Uh, so what are we going to do? Well, maybe I'll just tell you a story. <laughs> OK. Uh, so Millie has impacted my life in a lot of different ways. And it started before I'd ever met Millie. Uh, because uh, Millie and Jean, her husband, they, they, they collaborated on a number of projects in the early days, uh, and there were four that stood out. Um, and one of those four was this guy, uh, Paul Dresselhaus, their son Paul. And it turns out Paul and I went to grad school together, and in fact, we were in the same group, and we even roomed together for quite some time. So at that time, so Paul was, uh, you know, he was just one of the, one of the guys, but he was one of the guys who would go home on the weekends and his mother would do his laundry and his group theory homework. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, that was pretty weird. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's, all, that's all I knew of Millie at that time. But Paul was an amazing guy and, and uh, you know, just a, is an amazing guy. I'm sorry, he's, he's still uh, more than happily with us. Uh, in fact, so this is me back then uh, in front of an evaporator, my friend Bruce. And Bruce and I, who was also in the lab, we would just go around trying to do experiments and we had lots of creative ideas. But we also just broke stuff all the time. We were not that good at experiments. And we would break stuff. And Paul would come around behind us and just fix everything for us. And we would just keep going about our business, doing some new experiment. We'd break the, the, the cryostat or the evaporator, and Paul would come along and fix it. And, and we could never figure out why he did this, um, why he was so, you know, so thoughtful. Because he was kind of a gruff guy back then, but boy, he was wonderful in the lab. And you know, I assume that's because of Millie, but, but I don't know. And I should say this, this story really has no point. Um, <laughs> It's just making me avoid this empty box here. So, <laughs> so, what, so what are we going to do about the empty box? So we got desperate. We started thinking about all kinds of ways of, if not actuators, at least systems for motility. Uh, and there are lots of choices out there. And just to, you know, we had these, these uh, photovoltaics, right? these photodiodes, so we could shine light on them and generate voltages, and then maybe have some electrodes over here. And maybe they'll be, these electrodes will be inside of little tubes. And if we shine light on it and create enough voltage, what happens to water when you put a lot of voltage across it? Uh, you break it down and make oxygen, and maybe we'll spew out bubbles and make an actuator that way. It sounds like a completely stupid idea, but we did it anyway. Um, so here's one of these devices, about 100 microns in size. 
a bunch of photovoltaics in series, making uh, hydrogen bubbles on one side and oxygen bubbles on the other. And, and this one's stuck down, so it doesn't go anywhere. But if you, uh, if you wait a second, here's one that's free, comes cruising by, little bubble rocket. <laughs> by the way, why does it turn like that? H2O. Darn, there's more hydrogen than oxygen made. When, yeah. um, but anyway, we can fix that. But, so, so we're having fun making these bubble rockets, but, but come on. Well, first off, they're unbelievably uh, ineffective. The, the efficiencies are 10 to the minus 8 or 10 to the minus 9 or something. The only thing worse would be optical tweezers, whose efficiencies are at the legal limit of bad for converting uh, energy to momentum by the speed of light. Uh, but these are still bad. And, and for, plus, they're, they're not, the, you know, legs. We want legs, uh, not, not, not bubble rockets. All right, so here's the answer. It's called a, we call it a C. Uh, and this is a little probe, and this is something. And if we apply a voltage to it, it, it curls up. And the scale bar here is 10 microns, so it's curling up with a tight radius of curvature. So something worked. Uh, and you may be asking then, well, what voltage are we applying here? Uh, so this is the curvature measured as a function of the voltage. This whole thing is in solution. It's in water. So the whole thing is in an electrolyte. Uh, and as we uh, measure the curvature as a function of the voltage, we see it goes from one state to another. And it does it over the course of about 100 millivolts or so. In fact, uh, it, it does it. It's more or less KT. It's like the turn on of a MOSFET or something like that. It's got a... Uh, Subthreshold swing of you know 100 millivolts per decade or something like that. So it's pretty good, uh, and you can actuate it with 100 millivolts or so. So this is looking good. It's a good actuator, and it works with very small voltages. So a single photovoltaic, for example, could easily drive it. Uh, okay, so what is it? Um, it? It's we call it a surface electrochemical actuator, and it works based on electrochemistry that any electrochemist would know uh, about platinum, but it just hasn't been used in this way. Uh, so the idea is we start with a very, very thin piece of platinum, typically you know, 5 to 10 nanometers thick, and we cap one side. And originally, we capped it with graphene because you know, graphene's cool. Uh, and later, when we got tired of transferring graphene and all the horrors of graphene, because graphene is not industrial yet, uh, we replaced it with just another metal like titanium or what have you. So it becomes a kind of a bimorph. And then what happens is, on this free platinum surface, as you change the voltage relative to the electrolyte, uh, if you go in one direction, hydrogen will stick on the surface. If you go in the other direction, oxygen will stick on the surface. If you go even further in that direction, you'll actually oxidize the platinum itself. Uh, but in any case, as soon as those atoms stick on the surface, as you might imagine, they kind of cause it to swell. Now, in a piece of bulk platinum, this will do nothing, because it's just an atom layer on the surface. But if it's really thin, it can work. And in fact, so the way we did this, by the way, the way we fabricate these devices is we got good at doing basically standard, another standard semiconductor technique. So we got to steel again. Uh, it's atomic layer deposition. And we got pretty good at making ultra-thin ALD layers, uh, the paper here, um, and then cap one side of it and then put voltages on them. And you get that behavior that I showed you. And if you want to graph it on that space that I was showing you, it sits right up there in the middle of the place where we, we needed something. So here we couldn't steal, but we were able to invent something. Uh, and once you've got that, you can make all kinds of cool things. Uh, I don't know what happened here. That one doesn't play. That one was really cool, that one there. <laughs> uh, you can make things that dance. I don't think this one's going to play either. Maybe this one. Uh, that crinkle up in all kinds of weird ways. So you can really start to make uh, m at least tens of micron scale actuatable machines that do whatever you, you want them to do. Uh, it's kind of fun. Uh, so, you know, all right, we're looking good. We've, we, we've got some legs. In fact, the first thing we did that, you know, these things can be made in massive parallel. It's lithography. So we made the, the legs of a potential robot army, just all the legs <laughs> waving at you. Uh, it, it makes you feel strangely powerful, doesn't it, when they, when they do that? We spend hours just having them wave at us. Um, and then we started to design uh, actual 
micro robots. In fact, Mark Miskin, uh, then a postdoc who's now an assistant professor at UPenn, uh, was the lead on this and really pushed this forward. It was, it was not easy. Uh, and here's the basic design. It's got a body. Uh, the, the brains, in this case, is nothing more than a couple of photovoltaics, a couple of uh, solar cells that we're going to shoot light on them, cause them to actuate and apply a voltage to a set of legs, one set or the other, which will cause the legs to move and cause it to actuate, et cetera, et cetera. And these little other things that you see are just kind of like uh, panels that, that make it fold in the proper direction. They're just little, uh, they're like the, the bones in your arms, and the, the hinges are like that, OK? Um, and again, each one of these is about uh, you know, less than 100 microns in size. So this is actually, compared to that water bearer, this is quite a bit smaller, even. Um, OK, I, I like this is my favorite video, and it better play. So this is, this is the, the robots. They've been made. Uh, they're ready to be released and go out into the world. So they're on, the, they're on the, the wafer still. And here we go. We're etching away the final layer that's holding them to the substrate. You can start to see them. And here in a second, they'll actually get released. Boom. Yeah, the pre-stresses cause them to sort of jump into their original configuration. And now they're just floating free and, and, and ready, ready, to, ready to go. Um, kind of scary. <laughs> kind of exciting. I don't know. Uh, oops, we've lost another video. So this is a cool video of uh, one of our little robots when an, a, a paramecium swims by. Uh, the, all you need to know is the paramecium looks like a shark. It looks big, OK? Um, but these things are also really robust. Um, for example, you can take a pipette, and you can vacuum them up if you want. Whoop, there they go. Uh, and then re-squirt them out somewhere else. Uh, and they, they survive quite well, because they're so small that the shear forces that are applied to them are not very big. Um, OK, so that's cool. Uh, but do they walk, right? That's the real question, right? So um, well, let, let's, let's talk to Millie again. Um, <laughs> So follow your, your interests, get the best available education and training, set your sights high, be persistent, be flexible, keep your options open, accept help when offered, that's a biggie, and be prepared to help others. That's some pretty good words to live by right there. So I think if you ever can't find your way in life, go back to that and look at that. I think Millie really told us how to go. But come on, do they walk? That's the question. So let's see. Yes, OK, there you go. So we shoot the laser at the front and the back. Yeah, you can applaud. Now applaud the tiny robot. Thank you. So this is the equivalent of the kid out there uh, at MIT, on, the, on the lawn of MIT. In this case, you just have a laser that you're moving back and forth between these two dots, and the robot runs around. And you know, admittedly, this robot is, is pretty simple. You know, it's just got a couple of photovoltaics and a couple of arms. But there's nothing to stop you from taking all the pieces that I've given you in the earlier parts of this talk, full CMOS devices, et cetera, put a few thousand transistors on here with some sensors, have this thing climb up optical or chemical gradients, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a little more work to get this more ironed out, and then the world is our oyster in the nanoscale robot world. Um, so uh, with that, I, I just want to stop and first thank the micro-roboticists who made this possible. It's a huge group of people, in particular at Cornell, Itai Cohen on the faculty side, uh, and Al Molnar, who I already mentioned, have been my equal partners in this, in this uh, attempt to make tiny robots. And a tremendous number of students and postdocs have, have also joined in to make this possible. But mostly, I want to thank uh, Millie for bringing us all here together today. Thank you. So, Paul, uh, we, we have many questions for you. Uh, so, rather than have you stand up, do you mind sitting down and we can start asking? Sure. <laughs> um, with this, I would like to open the floor to the audience to ask any questions of Paul. Any questions? There's a question in the back there. This isn't the most scientific question, but I was just wondering when you're working with these things, is there a risk of inhaling them? Is that <laughs> <laughs> just, just wondering, putting them in the brain. Is that a problem with people handling these things? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. You know, are these, 
you know, they, they settle out pretty quick. Uh, you know, they're pretty heavy as, the, as, uh, as dust particles go. So they'll drop out pretty quick, so there's not, they don't have a significant vapor pressure, put it that way. <laughs> uh, I think if you tried hard, you could probably snort one. I am assuming <laughs> it would get caught in the hairs of your nose and it would be fine. Uh, it's so small that your body would process it probably with no problem. And it mostly, at least, you, most of the stuff that presents to the outside is glass, or in some of the earlier versions, SU8. So they're pretty benign. There's a tiny bit of gallium arsenide on there, but so small that you probably get more just, you know, walking through the halls of MIT than you, than you would from that. <laughs> um, so th they're, they're probably pretty benign, uh, but that's a physicist talking and, and not a biosafety person. Uh, there's a question back there. Uh, hi, I'm just curious, um, what direction do you see like signaling in these robots going? So obviously you're still using, you know, LEDs and, and photodiodes now, but um, and you were saying that the radio waves don't scale well, so I guess where, where do you see it going in the future? Where, where, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, l light is awesome, right? And light wins, usually gets there first. Like all of optogenetics and everything, light keeps winning uh, as a way of getting information into and out of small-scale systems. So I think in the short term, light is definitely the, the one to beat. Um, if you're wanting to do deep neural probing, there's one small problem, that your brain is not transparent, at least not until, you know, uh, they soak it in the right chemicals, uh, so that doesn't help. Um, there are, but even though you're, a lot of the light that goes into your brain, like if you hold a red LED up to your thumb, at light, you can see a decent amount of light go in. So there's a lot of scattered light that can get in, hit the device, cause it to blink, get out, and detect it. You just wouldn't be able to ray trace it back to where it came from. So even with optics, there's, a, there's maybe more room to work than you think. Uh, there's a competing, or a, a competing is too strong a word, there's a different technology out there that's really cool that's just starting to get going. Uh, it goes by the name of uh, neural dust, uh, which is, uses ultrasonic, uh, basically sound waves. Uh, that gets the wavelength small not by making the frequency go high, but by changing the effective speed of the, of the wave. And, and as you know from imaging systems uh, using ultrasound, you can penetrate into the body pretty well with that. So I think that's another very interesting technology as well for getting information in and out would be that kind of ultrasound approach. And so again, our philosophy, our point of view is we want to make our little platform completely modular and anything you know how to do and can integrate into standard CMOS, we want to make that go smoothly so that we can just keep adding functions on top of each other. Because that's what made electronics uh, work and be amazing was the ability to just pick and combine pieces in new ways without too much trouble. How big would these uh, robots have to be in order to store memory on them? So could you ever make them programmable? Yeah, that's, that's another really, really good question. Uh, so if you go to a Silicon Foundry, you can find ones that will give you memory on them in this kind of platform. So yes, you'll be able to get some small amount of memory. And, and I should zoom out and say an RFID tag, the computer part of the, 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 the silicon part of the RFID tag looks a lot like one of these. Uh, it's usually a little bit bigger, but part of that is just for ease of handling and what have you. Uh, but yeah, you can get memory and uh, um, computation if you're, if you're willing to work hard. But you have to find the right foundry uh, that, will, that will do that for you. And for us, we also want it on SOI. Uh, we want to be able to release it from the substrate in a facile way. So, so if, if we can ask you, though, maybe on that, uh, you show this 100 by 100 microns as dimensions of devices yeah. uh, as viewed from the top. Yeah. What's the thickness? Uh, the thickness uh, for the, OK, so there's two answers to that. For the most of what I showed you, it's about three or four microns. So oh. that's the thickness of the, of the silicon. And then maybe a, there might be a couple of microns of encapsulant of one sort or another. So 10 microns would be including the glass or SU-8 or whatever we put it in. Uh, the, that first generation of foundry devices was on bulk silicon, so we had the back etch and stuff, and they're, they're more like 100 microns thick. So but that's a terrible technology, and we're not going to do it anymore. We're going to go to SOI. Um, so in principle, you could harvest some of the ultrasound if you chose to use the thin membranes. Yeah, there's the nothing, MEMS devices, whatever yeah. you want, you should be able to put on this. Uh, th there's another crazy, you know, MRI version too, uh, a, a great MRI contrast, uh, or, or, well, let me back up and say something else. A great contrast agent for ultrasound are bubbles. So it may be that you're, you'll have your little bubbler to make a bubble that gets bigger and smaller to get read out by your ultrasound system. So. 
So then you don't, so the bubble may be the MEMS device. Huh. Other questions? Um, how can they communicate with each other? Is that, so we, we are ignoring that problem for now in the sense of we, they all communicate to the, the great power in the sky and then it comes back down. Uh, having said that, there, there's some simple ways that they could communicate in the near future that I've sort of hinted at here. Like those legs, like, well, let me put it this way. You can create, th that little thing that was making bubbles can also just make pH gradients. It can make extra H, uh, H plus or OH minus. That can go over to the next robot, make, you know, diffuse away to the next robot, and that will cause the voltage at which its leg to actuate, for example, to change, which would cause it to bend. So we could build in what looks like chemical signaling pretty easily, and we'll probably do that. But having them talk, like, through the optics is, is a big challenge, and for now, we're going to, they all have to go through us. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what's the functional lifespan of some of these devices? Yeah, if you don't do anything dumb, uh, a long, long time. Uh, the, the, the actuators are probably the hardest part, because, you know, you're taking a piece of metal and bending it, and, but certainly hundreds and thousands of actuations seem okay, as long as you don't apply too big a voltage. Uh, I should say, I didn't talk about it, but if you apply a pretty big voltage, you can actually oxidize the platinum, and then it will hold that shape when you take the voltage away, but then you can erase it by reducing it and, and unoxidizing it and sending it back again. So there's also a memory in the a muscular memory that can be used as well. But uh, your, your question is one that, so the core electronics will last forever. Uh, it, it's just rock solid. Some of these elements that are more out there in like anything doing electrochemistry, it's a bit scarier. Thanks for the talk. Um, have you figured out a way, you might, it might have been in that video that didn't play, but a way to get uh, the devices to swim in a fluid or something like that? Because at a really low Reynolds number with the characteristic length, then it, time reversal is going to be an issue, if you know yep. what I mean. Yep. So uh, really, really good, really good point. Um, so first off, the one thing, every, every material you use in uh, the clean room, uh, weighs more than water, uh, is denser than water. So they all, these things sink uh, unless you work really hard to make them not sink. Uh, we're working on making ones that, that create a bubble and float up and can become neutrally buoyant, but that's kind of unpleasant. Uh, we're also building a system now where we'll have two, uh, like an oil and water uh, interface and they'll live at that interface, uh, but then it's more, and we can mechanically make them viscously similar so it looks kind of like they're swimming in 2D with water on both sides. Uh, uh, but you, you're absolutely right. Then it, it allows us to go after a whole bunch of questions about uh, actuation and motion in small-scale systems, which people are doing now, but we'll have a lot more control. Like, you can control how fast it's going. And For example, we're making uh, two kinds of swimmers now, uh, one of which uh, is a Purcell swimmer, as they say. A low Reynolds number, if you do this, you don't go anywhere. Uh, but if you do this, you can go somewhere. Um, so you have a work cycle and you can go somewhere. And then we're also just making pure out flagella where you do this and get a work cycle because of the mechanical delay of the bending of the, of the cantilever. So we're excited about going after all those kinds of small scale locomotion problems with the system as well. But there's a lot of work that's already been done in that vein, I should mention. Hi, very good talk, thank you so much. I really appreciate, we really appreciate you bringing many swords to us today, mentoring to us again to me, sir. So I have a question about your robotic. Did you study the lifetime and the sensitivity would change when you put in the solution because the material stability is a question there? So I think I understood the question to be that What's the lifetime of these yes. things? Yeah. Have you started a lifetime? Yeah. So the, you know, the great thing about working with inorganic materials like this is, is they're just rock solid. You know, they were not made by some weak, you know, slightly KT protein sticking together. <laughs> Boy, these were in a furnace and they got hot and they found a ground state they're not getting out of for a while. Um, so they're really well made. Uh, so the, the core of it will just live forever as opposed to organic type systems. Uh, having said that, the, the parts that touch the, as I was saying before, like the, 
the platinum electrodes and things like that undergo all the normal sort of corrosive processes that you would, you would worry about. And uh, other things come up, like if you're going to use them for neural implants, is there scarring? Will the, will the tissue respond to it in a negative way? Although there's a lot of evidence that if you get below a certain width, it doesn't do that. So we've act, we're making these long, skinny ones that should, we hope, not set off, a, roughly speaking, an, an immune response. So is there a domain of physics that you can explore with this that you couldn't do with uh, the typical probes? I mean, you certainly have showed us things like monitoring temperature in microfluidics or ionic concentration, yeah. which are remarkable. I mean, as a way of having a local nanoscale, well, micron scale probe. Yeah. So we're thinking about a few things. Like uh, uh, on a, on a physics front, um, you know, a lot of uh, crystal growers can grow crystals, small crystals of interesting materials, say quantum materials that might have interesting magnetic or or what have you properties, but they can, before they can grow big ones, they can grow small ones. Uh, and it would be nice to be able to do measurements on small ones, but things like heat capacity and what have you are really hard to do on small samples because you've got this giant large yeah. system. So we do have a project to put them on uh, uh, those kind of systems and try to do heat capacity measurements. I should say also anytime you don't want wires, like in pulse magnetic fields, to do these kinds of either electrical or heat capacity measurements in, in these, you know, uh, 100 tesla millisecond scale pulsed magnets. There's no big wires to, to pick up an EMF, et cetera. Or NMR systems as well, uh, to be able to do electrical measurements inside of it while doing MRI. So I think these may have all kinds of niche applications in places that you wouldn't want to use yeah. regular electronics. Yeah. On, on that note, Paul, I know there are many more questions to be asked, but maybe you can join us with the reception that's about to follow. Uh, to conclude, though, the session, I'll ask for Nazni Root to take over. Thank you all for being here today. Paul, on behalf of everyone in the room, and my channel, and my channel, thank you for being here today for a wonderful time and helping us celebrate Melly. We have a very small memento, handmade here at MIT's own glass lab, just uh, as a token of our appreciation. Thank you very much. So, so I'm not allowed to touch that, I <laughs> but, I, but I'm allowed to touch this. So, uh, um, I mean, this, uh, I, I do want to hold it. Do not grab the stem, and I would pick up the pumpkin itself. Oh, you want me to? So do pick up the pumpkin. Now I'm even more scared. Exactly. You're no more terrified than we are. All right. <laughs> I'm sure this will be one of the highlights of my professional life to be able to, uh, to honor Millie uh, by being here with you today. So thanks to all of you for everything. And thanks to, most of all to Millie. Thank you. So the reception will be in room, uh, building for room 349 and everyone is welcome to join.